And it is my great pleasure to be here with you tonight. How many of you guys are students? Wow, that's terrific. I'm so glad you're here particularly because uh, you are about to go on a journey with an extraordinary leader by the name of Kailash Sartiarti, who has been working on behalf of 100 million children just like you so that they may be free from child labor around the world. And uh, this week at Davos, we spent a lot of time talking about policy. And a lot of people are here thinking about how we can change the systems uh, that create an enabling environment for things like child labor. And one of the reasons that I'm always so excited to share the content we make is because when you're talking about policy, it's sometimes easy to lose sight of the human beings who are living the challenges uh, that we're trying to solve. And what you'll see here is how one man has spent his life working to change the lives of millions of kids. Participant Media was founded on the idea that great storytelling can inspire action. And we believe that there's an activist in all of us. If you have a conscience and you know the difference between right and wrong, you have the power to be an activist. And so tonight you'll learn about Kailash's journey to activism. And what I hope it does is inspires in you, whether it's the 32nd step towards changing the world or just the first step towards changing the world, I hope this story of one man's impact on the world will inspire all of you uh, to take on that mantle as well. So with that, I present to you an extraordinary journey, The Price of Free. Thank you. 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 Well, I can see that the applause that you got and the reactions on the faces of people that the film has made an impact, and the message hopefully will be taken forward outside of this room as well. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us here uh, for what promises to be an engaging and stimulating conversation with a man who spent uh, all his life trying to organize civil society, trying to move legislation to improve the lives of millions of children around the world. I've had the privilege of uh, speaking with uh, Kailash Satyarthi several times in the past, and we've done some work with him back in India as well. So I'm uh, particularly privileged to be here this evening to speak with him. The theme in Davos this year is Globalization 4.0, Mr. Satyarthi. And we talk about technology, and we talk about trade, and we talk about trade negotiations and investment, but nobody talks about the globalization of compassion, and that is what you've spent your life working on. Why is it that that message doesn't go through? Thank you. Thank you, everyone, first of all, for all your love and respect for me. Uh, we have seen the results of globalization of markets, technology, economies, and uh, knowledge, of course. And we have seen the results in both ways. We have seen the Philip side of it, and we have seen some advantages of it. But uh, I feel that uh, if 152 million children are still working at the cost of their childhood and freedom and education, we cannot call ourselves cultured and civilized, advanced in any, uh, in any manner. <laughs> Even if one single child is in danger, world cannot call itself that this is a safe planet. So I started thinking that let us globalize compassion. Mm. We have globalized everything. Okay. I'm not talking about sympathy or empathy. Sympathy is the outermost circle. Empathy is a little bit inner. But when we talk of compassion, it is a feeling for the suffering of others as it is your own suffering, and then a drive 
to change that situation of suffering and that becomes compassion. And I strongly feel that all religions in the world were, were born out of compassion of some people. May it be Jesus, may it be Buddha, may it be Gandhi, may it be uh, uh, Hazrat Muhammad. They were compassionate. Similarly, the revolutions and changes also born of compassion. When some people felt that Mao felt or Lenin felt or Maas felt that something is going wrong in the society, that was the spark of compassion. So we have globalized everything. Now time to globalize compassion because compassion is the most precious gift of God which we all have inside us. But we don't recognize it, we don't acknowledge it, we don't respect it, and we think that there are drops of waters, but it's not true. It's an ocean which is inside each one of us. So my, my effort by doing all these work is to ensure that let us globalize compassion. You know, you talk about globalization of compassion and a lot of progress has been made. Uh, this film is an indication of the ground that has been covered so far. But as you look at the world today, uh, and there is a sense that political leaders especially are starting to look more inwards, uh, insular. Uh, there is protection. There's this sense of nationalism at the exclusion of others. In that context, do you worry uh, about being able to take this story forward, being able to achieve the goals set out uh, you know, by, by the UN, etc., eradication of child labor by 2030. And I'll link this to what we're seeing on the healthcare side as well, where a lot of the change and the progress has been made on account of development assistance from developed countries. Do you fear that we are going to see less of that as we move forward? I don't fear, but I'm definitely concerned. I'm concerned seeing the trends as well as the, the political and economic situation where the children do not, uh, do not gain that priority in the development agenda, in political agenda, or economic agenda. So that is, that is a matter of concern. That world is not spending enough, investing enough, in fact, on education for children or well-being of children. When we talk of education, mm. $22 billion additional money is needed to ensure primary education for all children. That's it, That's $22, it. $22 billion, billion dollars annually. And what is this $22 billion? That is four and a half days of global military expenditure. So if you, I'm just bringing that comparison, that what is the priority of, of the world? The education of our children? which can open up the future, which can open up uh, the windows of all the opportunities, which can uh, act as uh, assurance for all human rights and dignity and justice and equality, education. But we don't prioritize education. Our priorities are different. So uh, this film, in fact, uh, is trying to raise these questions. And I could, I could feel inside you what is, what is happening inside you. We started feeling that many of you never thought that slavery still exists in its cruelest forms like this. Uh, even worst, because uh, these people uh, could do filming uh, in a limited manner, yeah. but the situation is even worst in many parts of the world, not only in India. So we tried to build the sense of moral responsibility towards each other. And that will help in pressurizing our lawmakers and governments to prioritize the issues of children in the broader development in human rights discourses. Uh, and that is possible. I have seen, I have seen it. Uh, or I would say that uh, somehow I have contributed in bringing about that change, that the number of child laborers, as you have seen, has gone down from 260 million to 150 million. Uh, in in last uh, 16, 17 years. So it is possible. I would say that if we are able to ignite compassion among young people, mm. the change is inevitable. No politicians, no prime minister, no president, no government can stop it. Change is knocking the door. 
in the minds and hearts of young people. They wanted to make this world a better place. Do you or not? Yes or no? Yes. <laughs> More just place or the place with all those evils and injustices? A just world? Yes, definitely. definitely. You are sitting in the front and your voice is, is louder than the voice of many of the young people. <laughs> I think you are still shocked with the, uh, with the film. Yes. Yeah. In, in few minutes, in a couple of minutes, you will recharge and your voice become, will become louder and louder. You know, and, and, and that's the perfect uh, uh, segue to, to put my next question to you before I open it up to the audience. You've been responsible uh, for organizing two very large civil society movements, addressing child labor as well as education. You know, you've got a lot of young people here in this room. They would want to make an impact. They would like to engage with these causes. How do you go about doing it? How do you involve civil society? Forget government, what the government uh, in the US or India or the UK does or doesn't do. But how do we organize civil society to work towards making it a more equal, fair, just world? So in, in both these uh, uh, worldwide uh, campaigns, or you can call it movements, the Global March Against Child Labor, as well as the Global Campaign for Education, I highly depended and counted on the power of young people. In 1998, when we demanded an international law against child slavery, child trafficking, use of children in hazardous occupations, most of the governments did not buy it because they said that, OK, it's an ongoing thing, and we cannot stop it because of our economic situations and poverty and so on. But the youth did not accept it. And when we organized a physical march across 103 countries, 15 million people and mostly young people from schools, colleges, and universities participated mm. in it. And they said very profoundly, very strongly, with strong moral voice and authority, that world is not so poor that cannot give books and pencils in the hands of young people in the world and take away the guns and tools. And nobody could say no to it. 71 president prime ministers joined the march because they realized that the power of young people uh, is not going to forget and forgive them, them. So eventually, this law has been made. Similarly, in the global campaign of, in education, mm. for education, 32 million young people uh, signed up and joined hands. Now, trusting on the power of young people, not only the power of their energy and enthusiasm, but the power of their morality, their purity of heart, their, their anger, uh, and their, uh, their drive to change the world and make this world a better place. I have launched a new campaign, 100, 100 million for 100 million campaign. Yeah. In short, we call it 100 million campaign. 100 million young people of your age are victims of violence, slavery, trafficking, child labor, bonded labor, etc. 50 million children out of them are on move, looking, navigating for a safer place tonight to stay because they are displaced from their houses and homes and countries and became refugees because of global warming, because of uh, crisis in the countries and conflicts and so on. So 100 million young people are facing these problems which they are not responsible for. On the other hand, world has 3 billion youth below the age of 25. And I count on them. Out of them, hundreds of millions are ready to take up challenges. Mm. Hundreds of millions are willing to do something now, now, right away. And they wanted to prove themselves that they do exist in the world and they can shape a new world which is more just and more equitable hundreds of millions of young people, and that is my experience working across 150 countries in the last 20, 30 years. So trusting on that, I call 100 million youth to be the change makers, to be the leaders, to be the voices of those 100 million left out sisters and brothers of yours. Why those 100 million young people of your age are suffering or younger than you are suffering? This is unacceptable. So I call, I'm calling 100 million young people. 
Do you like this idea? Yes. Who like the idea? Raise your hands. <laughs> Full house. Full house? <laughs> I tell you, I was telling her that childhood is not an age. If you still have courage to question, if you still can challenge wrongs, if you still can laugh freely, cry freely, talk to people freely without any hesitation, you can never become old. Even if you are 70 year old, I feel that you can still remain hungry, uh, 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 angry young man or young woman. <laughs> so you can raise your hands. Don't, don't, don't be shy. I'm asking all of you, those who believe that 100 million young drivers should shape a new world a better world to save this generation and all the generations to come. Then raise your hands. Oh God, I did not say that raise your one hand. I said raise your hands. Raise your hands. Oh, good, great. I'm sure you are still very young. What about you? You were a little late? No, no, everybody is young. Yes, yeah, so as, as you've said uh, rightly, uh, that it's a mindset, it's, it's, it's not a number. Uh, do people, government specifically, take you more seriously now, post the Nobel? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> At least they, they say that they are taking me seriously. <laughs> but they will definitely take me and 100 million young people seriously when the, when the youth take the charge for change. And that's why I am counting not only on the governments, of mm. course, I go to the governments and talk to the president, prime ministers, kings, queens, and so on, uh, the business leaders. I will keep on doing it. But frankly speaking, my real trust lies in you and you. So let me get questions here. Y yes, sir, uh, a young gentleman there with the microphone. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you very much for the young. Uh, my name is Fernando Morales de la Cruz. I am from Cafe for Change, and we work basically to eradicate child labor and extreme poverty, its cause, in coffee, tea, and cocoa. Uh, we do this because we believe that we have to focus in certain industries, which are the largest offenders. And uh, I must tell all of you who are here, and those who are Swiss, that Switzerland has actually more child labor in its supply chain of mm. coffee, tea, and cocoa than children attending all Swiss schools in all of the Swiss cantons. This is not only cruel and unacceptable, but it's illegal because mm. child labor, as Mr. Satyarti and everybody knows, is illegal. But it's a great business for the multinationals. Mm. So uh, on your question of what all we could do, <laughs> uh, I'm working on this, but I think that perhaps we need to change the business models mm. of these multinationals. And it would be great if some of these uh, leaders who are here committed to improving the state of the world would actually accept that they need to change that business model. I've uh, met the CEOs of many of the largest coffee, cocoa, and tea companies. Mm. And believe me, it would be so easy if we just added 10 cents per cup. If we added 10 cents per cup of coffee in Switzerland, no consumer would blink. But of course, with those 10 cents, we would fast track rural development in coffee, cocoa, and tea producing regions. And one last fact, which is important, I think, there are three million children producing cocoa, harvesting it. And there's a Swiss family which has 750,000 children of those three million working for it. They're not about to get arrested. They get development aid from the Swiss government and the European Union. Thank you. Well, uh, those, those, are, those are the stark facts that we need to accept and deal with as well. And we were talking about this. How do you make it? You know, countries may have laws uh, and, and companies will need to comply with them, but even, uh, even with the legislative framework in place, you're seeing this play out country across country, supply chain across supply chain. How do you make it legally binding? How do you bring in accountability? So first of all, I would underline here that we face the serious uh, political deficit or lack of political will. We don't have adequate global political will first of all, to make stringent laws, and secondly, to enforce those laws. Secondly, uh, he was talking about the business model. Let me tell you that I am uh, the founder or co-founder of the International Cocoa Initiative. Um, it has its office in, in Switzerland. 
but we have challenged many, com uh, many companies and tried to cooperate with them and brought them to our board to find some solutions to problem in Ivory Coast and Ghana, basically in these two countries, which are the largest producers of, of cocoa beans. Uh, so what we felt that whenever there is conscious consumers, the power of conscious consumers can change this business model. Mm. This is one way of doing it. Secondly, secondly the legally uh, binding conventions or the determinant laws, which countries have to make, or international laws, which can ensure that there is no child labor in supply chain, uh, the two ways of doing it. The third thing is but that- don't we already have those laws in we place? We don't have enough laws. We don't have, unfortunately, enough laws. Uh, these laws uh, are not the binding laws. Mm. When it comes to ILO convention, they are not binding conventions. Uh, we, we believe that the governments will uh, will change their laws according to ILO conventions and then uh, respect them. Mm. But if they don't do, uh, no action could be taken. So the accountability cannot be fixed uh, on the governments in that way. Uh, so power of consumer is, is very, very important. And that is the reason that in this film, at least two or three places, this question has been raised that um, how uh, the children are engaged in slavery in the supply chain of uh, the big brands. So this question has to be raised. So what, what, what I strongly suggest that we have to be responsible in encourage us to ask the questions to the retailers, shopkeepers, to make sure that child labor is not involved in their supply chain. Mm. That will help in putting pressure on them and eventually on the big companies, local as well as international brands. They cannot simply ignore it when it comes to it. One of the purposes of 100 million campaign is exactly that, that when 100 million youth in the world will start questioning the big companies as well as the governments that what are you going to do with the international laws? What are you doing going to do with your own laws which you made for, uh, for protection of mm. children in your country? And if millions of young people just uh, send a quick message using the social media or using our website to the bosses of the big companies, no company can simply put aside that kind of uh, email or letter or protest uh, from, uh, from the young people. And the youth are among the biggest consumers mm -hmm. of many items and many brands. Right. So that's why the consumer consciousness is the key and mass movement to put pressure on the governments is mm. equally important. And that's why going through or waiting for the conventional methods yeah. to create the mass movement which can generate political will mm. uh, may take long time. But the youth could be energized and take charge soon. So that is the idea of the campaign. You know, you talked about the use of technology and you want to get conscious consumers uh, to sort of use technology to reach out to brands and raise awareness about not using child labor or any other such, uh, such issues. But what about the use of technology and how much of that are you seeing, for instance, when it comes to stopping trafficking, when it comes to identifying missing children? Yeah. Uh, and and where, what is the future uh, for the use of technology in being able to address this problem? Uh, you have seen the uh, uh, the reunion of uh, Sonu, but it took about a year and a half uh, to find him because his parents were coming every day or every other day and knocking my door and it was so painful to watch them. In one of such private screenings last year during the Sundance Film Festival, uh, a young person, actually two or three, not just one, Ask the question, what is happening with Sonu? That time, Sonu was not yet found. Mm. So, uh, so you, you have noticed that something was added in the, the, in the last bit yeah. of the film yeah. because Sonu was not yet found. So everybody was asking in many places of the world, in the world, uh, in the private screening, that what, what is the fate of Sonu? Would you be able to find him or not? And I spontaneously said that if Sonu is alive anywhere in the world, We'll we will find, find him. We will find him. It took so many, so much time, but finally we were able to find them. But in this process, 
we, we, we started uh, learning that how we can use technology. The simplest thing was the facial recognition. In India, for example, 120,000 children are registered as missing children. Mm. And about 200,000 children are registered in various shelter homes, child care homes of the governments and civil society organizations. And many of them might be missing children from other part of the country. And we found Sonu in one of those shelter homes. So on the basis of that, when we found Sonu, an idea came to our mind that why can't we introduce the simple technology in gathering all the information, the faces of the missing children as well as the faces of all those children, photos of all mm -hmm. those children who are living in those uh, facilities. So it was not easy. Um, finally, the High Court of Delhi ordered it. And within a week, within a week, 6,000 children were reunited with their wow. families just through this simple technology of wow. facial recognition. Wow. It is possible. So that's why we have to promote use of technology in tracing these children. Well, uh, let me throw it open to more questions. Yes, if you can stand up, they'll get the microphone across to you. You've got one coming at you from both sides. Take, pick whichever one you like. <laughs> I don't care. Uh, wow. <laughs> I would like to thank you for sharing the love, the power, your ambition, and everything. I think those are the most important. It's so, so great what you did. What, where did you have this power from, this ambition, everything? How did you survive all these bad things you've seen? Yeah, and I just wanted to thank you for all that. Thank, thank you, you, thank you, thank you. And, uh, Frankly speaking, I draw the power from you, from young people. When you raised your hands, I felt empowered. I'm not a politician. I'm not a religious leader. I'm not a monk. I'm as ordinary as any of you are. And when I am giving a call to you, whether you are willing to join this, this campaign to shape a new world, you spontaneously raise your hands. That is my power. And I count on the power of you, which is my power. Well, you make it sound very easy. I'm sure it, it's not. But uh, we have enough time for two more questions. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Hi there. Um, I'm Sandy from uh, Hong Kong. I'm a lawyer and a public policy researcher. And I really believe in compassion. I, I think that is the answer to a lot of problems in the world. And I just wondered if you can give us insight into what Sonu's father was thinking, because I distinctly remember that question that you asked him in the documentary, which was, oh, you sold your son for 200 rupees and left him there. And I just had to check how much 2,000 rupees was. Oh, not 200, sorry, 2,000 rupees. Mm. And I spend more than that you know, for lunch. You know, and the thing about compassion is that you need to understand how the parents are thinking, right? It's not just about compassion for the children. And I wonder, how can we change the parents' thinking? Or, or uh, what is the, like, how can you possibly give your child, I just can't understand, and I just wondered if you can give us insight and to feel compassion for the parents. Why would they sell the child for, for something that I would spend over a lunch? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so uh, it does not happen in most cases when the parents sell their children. It happens once in a while, but in most of the times, the traffickers and the slave masters, they befool those parents and they make rosy dreams. They tell all the stories that your child would be able to earn money, he's happy there and all kind of things. And they offer some money. And how this trafficking begins in, in most cases. Only in a very, very few cases, the parents, because of pressure, because of they have no other choice, because they have lost all the hopes to find the chil child back, like in case of Sonu's father, he was satisfied with a small amount of money which was given in the end of the day. But Sonu's mother uh, did not sit quiet. She kept on fighting. She has thrown her husband away, told that you cannot come back home until unless you find Sonu. So the father later on realized, and he, he felt very badly later on. He 
uh, lied down on my feet and he, he, he was crying all the time that he made a big mistake by sending Sonu like that and, and accepting this small amount of money. So that was his case. But normally, we have to create an environment where we can generate hope in the communities and among the parents and some better alternate mm -hmm. for their lives. And for example, education. If they are sensitized enough and they understand the value of education in comparison to sending a child and earn quick money for a few years and then the child becomes sick and, uh, and, and, and lose all the hopes. So uh, I would say the consciousness raising in the is the first step towards social transformation. But that, that needs a lot of patience. That needs a lot of resilience. You have to, it's a lot of continuity. Um, so continuous patience, efforts have to be made to create awareness as well as raising consciousness in the society by way of uh, uh, giving some good examples, some success story, like in the villages which are trafficking prone areas, uh, we uh, take uh, some of the icons, like some local leaders or some uh, local police officers, uh, teachers, or headmasters, or people like that, uh, journalists who came from the same background or similar background or belong to same community or caste system in Indian caste. And when they tell the story, the woman from the lowest uh, social strata of society emerges as the district magistrate and she goes and talks to the people. Then they realize, oh, sending their daughters to work is not good, but uh, their daughter can be like, but like her. So um, these kind of examples and success story also helps in creating awareness in the society in practical terms. So we have so many activities in India and across the world in sensitizing people. You, uh, you know, there's plenty more questions in the room, but uh, unfortunately we are out of time. So to the audience here and the audience that's watching us online, if there is one message that you want to send out to Satsatati, what is it? One message would be with some practical thing is that don't fa wait for leaders outside to come and change the world and shape a better world. There is a leader inside each one of you. Feel the leader. Respect that leader. You need not to look for change outside the great people are coming and assembling here every year in Davos. Mm -hmm. Good. But the real leader is inside you. Real change is inside you. Start now. As you raise your hands, keep on raising your voice against wrongs. Make sure that these children are your brothers and sisters. Ignite that compassion inside you. Don't wait for others. So this is something which I have learned instead of waiting for everyone. When I was receiving the Nobel Peace Prize, I was invited to give the, uh, the, the acceptance speech and I lost my papers. And it never happened in the 100 years of their history. <laughs> uh, may it be Martin Luther King, may it be Nelson Mandela, may it be Dalai Lama, nobody has ever uh, lose their papers. They, the papers were there to read. Uh, and then everybody was nervous except me. And I started smiling and I said that I'm more comfortable now. And that I said that I'm going to tell a story. A heavy fire broken out in jungle. All animals were rushing for a safer place, leaving the jungle, including King Lion. And King Lion noticed that a tiny hummingbird flying straight towards the fire. And surprisingly, he shouted, what are you doing, committing suicide? The bird answered, no, sir, I am going to extinguish this fire. Lion asked, how come? You are crazy? She said, no, sir, look at my beak. I am carrying a drop of water. I am doing my bit because I was born and grew up in this jungle. I cannot leave. That's his history. There is a hummingbird inside each one of you. 
just just identify it, acknowledge it, respect it. That hummingbird is calling to do something good for others, good for the society, good for this humanity, because this humanity belongs to you, young people especially. Whatever mistakes we made in our generation, you have to change that. Change those wrongs to rights that you can do. Ready to do? <laughs> Ready to do? Yes. No, this is not the voice of young people. <laughs> Ready to do? Yes. Great. Then join this campaign, and I think my colleagues might have distributed this short, uh, a small. Uh, uh, are you going to do it or going to distribute now? Yeah, they've got them. They've you got have got them. it. Yes. <laughs> are you going to sign up? Yes. <laughs> Again, raise your hands before we disperse. <laughs> Be my friend, <laughs> not the follower. Good. Thank you so Kailash much. Kailash Many thanks. May the force continue to thank be with you. Thank 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 you. Thank